The arms embargo on Libya is being called a joke by the UN special envoy to the country. Speaking at this weekend's Munich Security Conference, Stephanie Williams called on the international community to step up and hold those responsible accountable, as Heather Donald reports. On the sidelines of the Munich Security Conference, ministers and officials from a dozen countries gathered to discuss Libya on Sunday. The hot topic was how to cut off outside military support to the warring parties in the country. These discussions come after a summit took place in January in Berlin, where key players agreed to respect an arms embargo there. However, sticking to the embargo has not been entirely successful. It is important to establish transparency and to ensure that those who continue to break the embargo do not escape undetected. The situation on the ground remains deeply troubling. The truce is holding only by a thread with numerous, over 150 violations reported, and it is the Libyan people that continue to suffer the most. The economic situation continues to deteriorate, exacerbated by the oil blockade and a looming banking crisis. The participating countries and organizations today Amongst them, there was a consensus on the need to lift the oil blockade. Libya has been in turmoil since 2011, when dictator Muammar Gaddafi's regime was toppled. A UN-recognized administration now governs Tripoli and other areas, whilst parts of eastern Libya are ruled by General Khalifa Hifter, whose forces are trying to capture the capital. EU foreign ministers are meeting in Brussels later today to discuss how to monitor and enforce the embargo. Well, for more on the situation inside Libya, we're joined now by Rami Khoury, a senior fellow at the American University of Beirut. Thank you very much for joining us. Some of the language that was used there, saying this arms embargo is hanging by a thread. Why isn't it working? Who's still sending arms and what's their motivation for doing so? A lot of countries are still sending arms, and it's the same ones who have met uh, in uh, Geneva last uh, last week and, and our meeting in uh, in Germany today. Um, th these are countries in Europe, the Arab world, Russia, Turkey, um, and um, they just really don't have any agreement on st stopping the fighting. They say the nice things they're supposed to say, but they've just never been able to either uh, fully achieve a ceasefire or reduce the flow of arms or even monitor the flow of arms coming into the country. Uh, and they've never fully been able to stop the flow of, uh, of illegal uh, migrants and refugees and asylum seekers who are going to Europe increasingly from Libya now. Uh, my apologies. It was the ceasefire that she said was hanging by a thread. But... Why is the international community apparently just absolutely failing to enforce the commitments that they all collectively made? I think it's just the nature of modern statehood uh, in a slightly uh, chaotic world where the rules of international law are gradually breaking down, not just because of what the Trump administration has done, but this happened some years ago. Europe, for instance, has been unable to do anything serious about the Arab-Israeli conflict, um, uh, or other issues that it has had to address. It's very difficult to get so many countries to agree on a foreign policy uh, and implement it. And what happens in the end is that the national interest of a country, whether it's strategic or energy or financial or just prestige um, or dreams of uh, previous imperial glory, uh, these take precedent over any kind of commitment to international law. And we're seeing that happening uh, all over the place. And uh, particularly with the, the U.S. drive under Trump to basically th throw out any semblance of international law or U.N. resolutions. So you're seeing the Turks, the Russians, the Emiratis, the Saudis, uh, people, all, and including some Europeans, France and Italy are involved in Libya. People are just uh, paying lip service to their legal commitments and moral commitments and doing what they think is right for them because they know there's nobody there who's going to stop them. If they're just paying lip service, what would it take for meaningful peace to actually become a priority? What would have to change? The players on the ground would have to come to some sort of agreement. And they've indicated before that they're sort of ready to do that. 
uh, they've met several times and they've had all kinds of uh, mediation, serious mediation. Uh, but there's no sign of uh, of that happening. And part, it's a chicken and egg. The players on the ground aren't ready to really stop the fighting because they know that they're able to count on international support, both uh, political and military uh, support. So what you're seeing here really is a bigger problem with two sides to it, both of which are frightening. One is the essential uh, collapse of some states in the Arab world that were created like about 100 years ago or so, and they're falling apart. And uh, what you're seeing also is the inability of Europe, the other end of this gruesome book, and the inability of Europe, which has some very impressive states, uh, being unable to uh, come together and agree on a policy, even something so important to them as reducing the flow of illegal uh, migrants. So we have a real problem of statehood uh, and the nature of statehood in the modern world. Thank you for your analysis, Rami Khoury, senior fellow at the American University of Beirut.